Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. At, you have a beautiful lab here, so it's nice. So I'm uh, the director of the Fab Lab Amsterdam. And uh, this was established in 2007. And uh, it's actually right in this building here. But we are very fortunate. It's the second oldest monument of the city. And uh, this is, of course, a fantastic location because it's a medieval building. And now we have this fancy new machines there and so on. And uh, actually, the Fab Lab Amsterdam is hosted by the War Society, which is an institute of uh, art, science, and technology. And it was established in 1995, and we have about 60 employees at the moment. And we have very different programs like education, care, art, sustainability, public domain, locative media, serious games, narrative, bio art, high bandwidth video like 4K and so on. And we have also an incubator program which is called the Media Guild and spin-off businesses. And what you see right now here is a, a little poetry project we did uh, some years ago. It was actually a, an intern of mine who took, which I found very nice, who took the leaves from the square where the Fab Lab is located and pressed them and dried them and lasered in some poetry and put it back so the people could see it. It was nice. So here's the building again. And here where the little logo is, it's located. So it's like totally downtown if you want. I mean, Amsterdam is very slow. You can do uh, very uh, small. You can do everything by bike. And then actually the whole organization, the War Society itself, is there where the A is in this other monument monumental building. And this is how it looks inside. It's very small, cozy, but somehow it works. People like it. And this is like two weeks ago, we had a little workshop and so on. And then I found this picture, which I found kind of intriguing. That is 300 years ago. And it's exactly the same space. And uh, it's actually a pity if I wouldn't see it before I build up the, the Fab Lab, I would have incorporated some of the designs where you can see here. You could still smoke then, as you can see, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things, uh, one of the approaches, the Wall Society is uh, well known as the users as designers approach. Well, what does that mean? I think you use it a lot here as well. Is that you take, uh, you go to the end user on the very first stage, get some information what they actually want, so you don't invite, uh, invent a kind of alien device where nobody can understand. And uh, recently, uh, we, there's a one project I wanted to show, which is a glucosimeter. Uh, and uh, this guy made a little film, and we have developed that in our Fab Lab as well. And I think it's a good, it's a good um, example how you could approach that. Maybe you could turn the light off. Looks better. Well, I wouldn't call it stressful, but um, sometimes it still is. Yeah. But stress, stress, stressing is is very um, important thing by diabetes because when you see the result of the meter, you are not afraid, but you're very anxious to see what it tells you. Doesn't uh, agree you with your own feelings, then you're disappointed. It's the same when you do an exam and you uh, study it very well and you don't uh, get, get it. I get emotional of it. I, I see that, oh yes. You are not so sure about your own uh, body. It says 16.8.8, uh, then it's still 17 to me. Yeah. It goes uh, from zero till... Everybody's looking yeah. at the figure, yeah. mm -hmm. and they never, ever considered doing it differently. So a large group of people, uh, for instance, when they have type 2 diabetes, especially for those people, maybe it's not needed that it is that accurate. That, that they maybe uh, yeah. do it in a completely different way.
the shape and the way how it's done, it's it, it's kind of it's giving me a spring idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so in a way, that's that's already making me happy. For me, is immediately clear. Okay, and um... it's really yeah. It's echt helder. It's not so strict like an instrument. I feel more with that than with this. I, I, it's easier. Yeah, so, yeah, these are the things, you know, like making things that really matter. You can see that all these people with diabetes, you can make them a lot happier just saying high, low, medium, and that's it, and nothing, 16.7, whatever. Uh, another project which I'm currently working uh, on myself w is this low-cost prosthesis project we're doing uh, together with our Indonesian partners. Uh, we have developed one year ago uh, a sister lab, sister fab lab in Jogjakarta in the middle of Java in Indonesia. And one of their uh, business cases uh, was to develop a low-cost prosthesis because there's a lot of demand there and like production-wise, there it's it takes ages to make them, and people cannot afford them because they're very poor. So I thought when they came up with this with this idea, I thought that's really nice. So let's try make it happen. So we are working on this. Uh, you can see here bamboo rod instead of uh, uh, aluminium precision rod. We want to. Um, uh, fast, make the process faster as well, so that in the end, that literally two uh, people can walk in in the morning, 10 o'clock, and then we make a leg for them, and then they walk out with the leg at 5 o'clock in the evening. This is a little wall installation we did at the lab, so I can explain people what it's all about. And then this might look a little bit scary. Well, the sun is destructing a bit, but... Uh, it looks like I lost my leg, but I still have some meat, so don't worry. But this is a, a knee walker, as we call it. And this device um, we got from a professor of uh, uh, movement science from the UMCG, UMCG Groningen University. And uh, the thing is that I had uh, one evening, it was an evening about art and science in Groningen, where we showed this uh, knee walker, because what it does is it lets you experience how it would be if you had a prosthesis. And it was a kind of intriguing evening for me because I, I was standing there from eight o'clock uh, in the evening until two o'clock in the morning, fitting this knee walker on about 100 people. And I have to say like the, the difference of people, how they feel with it, how they walk or how they were able to walk or not walk was like day and night, it was amazing. but. On the other side, what we do is we want to make another one in order to use it ourselves to test our prototypes before we bother the actual users. So that's the knee walker, and then to, to the right you have two new uh, feet design, uh, which we are currently working on. I mean, I have to say this is a real challenge, this project, because you have to realize a Western, uh, a Western on lower leg. Uh, prosthesis is about 3,750 3, euros. We have insurance, so it's no problem for us. We can get one. Actually, we can get uh, every three years, we can get the new one. But in Indonesia, forget it. There is no insurance. There is no money. And uh, somehow the Western world is also only developing in this um, high-tech material, high-tech thing, Bluetooth readings from your roll-off curve and so on. But nothing goes into the into the low-cost sector. They're shipping containers of this expensive stuff, and it just doesn't make sense. So I think we, we would have a point to make here. Uh, this is our new uh, feed design, which we constructed this summer. It ju actually just consists of very cheap wood two pieces, which are loosely uh, together, and then you fill up with uh, polyurethane raisin. And then it becomes actually a feed which has uh, a little bit of response. Yeah, which you can see here. And this all still has to be tested, uh, thoroughly tested. But the thing is, this costs five euros, maybe. Yeah. And then, of course, the polyurethane is also not the, the real material that I would love to use, because what I really want to use is this stuff. And this is natural fiber from pine wood, 
banana bark and cocos fiber. And what we actually discovered this summer, which is really exciting, is this, uh, can you see it still? Yeah. Is this, um, this compound we made from a uh, pineapple tree plus uh, liquid plastic, which is also kind of polyurethane uh, mix, but you get actually a really accurate, good stump. Maybe it doesn't look yet kick-ass, but mm. the nice thing is it, it can breathe, which is really nice because in Indonesia temperatures are about 35 degrees. And it's very strong and it's very light. So here we may have something in our fingers, but still it has to be tested and it will uh, go on. And then, of course, since we are in Amsterdam, there is a huge community of artists and designers, fashion and so on. We do a lot of product design. This is something I developed as a kind of learning curve for people that go through all the stages of digital fabrication, which is a foosball table, but it was an interactive, in the end, it was an interactive foosball table because the nice thing that happened was that my, my interns, they were so eager to work on this thing, so they convinced me to to actually make it uh, interactive because I would have just done it manually because I, li I like to play and I think it's a nice social game so in between working and so we laid, made a little movie how we made this thing and what it can do this whole concept of the soccer table a little bit further and make it really our own thing and very importantly make it open source it could be uh, a very good learning project since you go through all kinds of digital fabrication methods. so everything is interactive and automatic. And so on. Of course, one thing uh, which I won't go in detail now, but one thing which we are also promoting is, of course, open design. We uh, bring out this book uh, last year in June, and it sells very well. There's various aspects of open design, not just blueprints and so on, but opening production chains and so on. But uh, Diana Hurst will zoom in more on that this evening at, what was it, quarter past seven or something? Yeah, I think it's while we're waiting for the jury to tell about which uh, project won uh, in the hackathon. It's uh, quarter past seven to eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of the things that I, I think that uh, we are a little bit specializing in Amsterdam is real products. Products that you don't really associate necessarily with the Fab Lab, but products that, uh, that people think like, wow, so I can do this here. And I, I was just asking myself, since I was uh, playing bass for many years, can I produce actually a high quality bass guitar using the methodology of a Fab Lab? And, but I'm not a luthier, so I started, started completely from scratch. So I, I uh, wrote, uh, was reading these two books, which I can highly recommend if you want to make your own. And, but the nice thing again, what happened there is this uh, student from the Design Academy came in who was busy with uh, textures on wood. So he came in and in one afternoon he built this stuff and I thought, wow, that's really beautiful. And then I just asked him, 
would you like to wrap around this one structure on my bass guitar? And so we got together and we worked on it until the very end. So we we modeled the, all these lines around the three-dimensional body, which I gave him in Rhino. And then we mailed out for hours and hours, which you could say, well, that's ridiculous. Why would you for mail out 40 hours to make a bass guitar? Well, you can make it much more easier, but I wanted to have a, a beauty, of course. So. So this is about 40 hours of milling, and then it came out. Then here's the neck, which we milled out in one piece, and then gluing. I mean, it was a huge job, I have to say. But the nicest thing is, like, uh, with making instruments, and I think we'll have to continue, is the moment where this thing is finally done. And then you plug in the cord for the first time and see what does it do. Uh, so here, this is my base, which I always looked a bit uh, that I can look how the, pr the real pros do it. And, but on the end, we had um, a decent bass guitar, which works actually quite fine. We also winded our own pickups and so on. And here, there was a little bit of disaster. Of course, I made a huge mistake because you can uh, only think, uh, no, you can only find on the web drawings from guitars from above, but never from the side. So actually, this levels was not accurate. So with the electronics in there, with the uh, with the neck glued in, everything, I had to go back into the milling machine. And here, I'm just uh, checking out whether it's straight. And then I had to mill out the bridge pocket again, some deeper. But it was fixed, and this was one of the first uses. Uh, but of course, I mean, Barcelona is, is very much uh, uh, into architecture, of course, obviously. And, but we did a little attempt here as well, which for me was very exciting because it was a kind of mixture of digital uh, technology and very old uh, traditional craft, if you want. So what we did is we, we made in this kind of uh, sculptures, which was basically very easy uh, profiling out stuff and put it together using this joinery system. And then on site, well, this was just this milling job, but then on site, uh, we put this basque uh, around it, and then with this old uh, mud pi pistols, I don't know, but you could just spray mud on. And you get really kind of sculptural uh, kind of things, which, which really made me think, well, okay, let's make our own house then. And it's actually cheap, and it's green, and you can vary, uh, vary forever. It was really nice. Alex, yeah? It's much sprayed on top of... Yeah, of this wooden structure. I don't know the, the exact English word, but you see it here. So it's, it's nearly this going back to how we did a house in the old time where you had a wooden structure, then you Absolutely. could spray... Yeah, we borrowed straw, it from that. Straw, yeah, this old clay. stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. Amazing. exactly. And then you can vary the, the finish, everything. It's really nice. That was a three-day job, actually, with a few people. And then, of course, there's a lot of art projects going on in our lab. One of uh, one of uh, a very nice example one I found is this. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Lillemann, and I had the opportunity to work with Michael Peltier and Random Studio to develop these mechanical cats. And the process started when Mike was doing research on these. Uh, sort of kinetic systems that Theo Jensen had developed, um, making his wind beast strand sculptures. And, uh, you know, the, the way these creatures moved was very interesting. And so we basically took those motions and did some mechanical tests, having the Adreno control these little motors and build these walk cycles. And from there, you know, the first thing that came to mind was, wow, these things really have this quadped kind of movement to them. and. Um, so we took the approach of, you know, giving it this aesthetic, which was a, you know, these psychedelic cats that were all drawn in Illustrator. And then from there, the challenges, you know, came up of like, all right, how do you draw this thing so that when it's cut out, it still works. It still works on the mechanic system that he had built. And so with some trial and error, we, um, yeah, we were able to make 12 of these things and laser cut them out, put them into the mechanical templates, and put it up on a, on a window. In this case, we set it up in front of our studio and backlit it with projectors. And this gave this old feeling of like a nostalgic shadow puppet, something similar to Lottie Renegar when she was doing that in the 20s.
nice one. I like it. Another project which uh, was made by interns, because you know, I, I'm running actually the Fab Lab Amsterdam alone, always with at least two interns. And somehow I get always these talented people. And then there were two guys from the Technical University in Eindhoven that came in and they wanted to do uh, a collaborative robot system based on the old uh, surrealist idea of cadaveric skis, which I think you all know. If you don't, this is actually a handmade one. So I fold the paper two times. I give it to you and then you draw a head and then I fold over. I give it to somebody else which can't see the head but has to has to draw a body and then you fold over again and the third one makes the leg so you have a collaborative uh, kind of human being monster I don't know what but that was the idea and they did the same with poetry but these two guys they uh, they pulled it off in three months to make this robot and, and their idea was in the end that they just have a cam common language, in this case of course Arduino, but that for instance in America they would only make heads and in Europe they would only make torsos and in Asia they would only make uh, legs, so then, and then there would be this exchange market and you just pop them together and you have all this strange uh, creature and that was the first uh, working one. Still really prototyping because the Arduino you see them. <laughs> there are actually five Arduinos in this. And of course the head is the is the brain that gives the function to the legs. In this case, the head is looking for a light and tells the legs how to go in the most efficient way to that light. But that's quite tricky stuff. So I was actually quite amazed uh, they pulled it off in three months. Here's some more. Uh, movements and you can see it better. <laughs> then this year was nice. We, we made our f uh, first own little booklet, which I'm quite proud of it. Unfortunately, I forgot them to bring with me a few, but um, I will send you a few so you have it. And if you really want one, drop me a mail and uh, I can send you one. So this was <coughs> like five years of Amsterdam, the nicest projects, but also like th the very different approaches why people come to us and make stuff. And uh, we did this on an old uh, Rizo printer, which is an old French, actually, uh, silk print-based matrix printer, which is very fast, but because of this approach, it has a very own aesthetic. It's very beautiful. It's really pain. I can't show it to you. And then uh, a few weeks ago, we did, since long time ago, uh, a survey asking people uh, all kinds of questions because we also, of course, want to go forward, improve our services and so on. And uh, this is actually a, to our... Uh, um, what do I want to say? <laughs> now, to our surprise, actually, there were about 200 people uh, participating on that. While we did also one survey three years ago, there were like 25 people. So now we had 200 people, and they all uh, had suggestions and so on, and I took all these suggestions together, and this was the work cloud. Well, I'm pretty proud of that. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was an amazing project. Uh, the cats, how did they move again? Because the machines before, the kind of ever motion machine, they normally move by wind or temperature. Uh, how did the cats yeah, move? No, they were really easy. Like, uh, uh, it was just stepper motors driven by an Arduino, actually. And then they had they just this very um, clever uh, turning point. So they, it was just like actually one movement. Oh, uh, yeah. So whenever they move over to one side, then the balance kind of yeah, moves the turning point. Yeah, exactly. So it was the, actually the challenge there was the mechanical system that all these arms had the right length and so on. Uh, but yeah, for the course. rest, yeah. it's actually just the motor turning. That was beautiful. Let's get some questions to Alex. Who's got a question? Then I got one. So it looks to me like you're actually working a lot with all kind of different companies and people and so it's not kind of only students, or how do you see your collaboration structure? 
who do you normally work with? Well, I have to say that I think the biggest target group target groups we have is definitely uh, students in their last year by their final exam, whether they are uh, architecture or uh, industrial design or fashion design. We have a lot of fashion design as well, but then all kinds of people approaching us. Actually, not not so much companies, and that's what we should head for more because. I mean, to be honest, we are not self-sustainable yet. We are kind of break-even, and we have two open days a week, which actually costs us money. But I think that's the most beautiful thing uh, Fab Labs are all about, that you have an open door, people can just come in. That cre creates an enormous diversity. And it's one of my biggest food to drive it on. But on the other hand, I want to be able to create enough business so we are self-sustainable. Mm. We're getting there. Yeah, but let's talk more about that because we are actually we are looking at the same here connectivity lab at Medea. What model are we going to do? And we know that in the long run we need to work with companies uh, to get a sustainable economy, but we also want to be free to do whatever we like. Uh, so That's this true. kind of balance, and I think actually also the Vermont makers that we hear later uh, with John from IBRN and Valerie. They put together makers movement, and they said a couple of days ago when we had some preparation, they said. The barriers was openness. Can people just get in when they want? And the second one is, if you make it our success, can you meet demands? That's not anything we experienced really yet, but I think we're going to learn a lot from them as well uh, on, on how to create these spaces. That's true. And I can say, uh, for me, at the moment, the best business model w we found is that is this Fab Academy. Uh, uh, I think Thomas was talking about it as well. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. You give people the chance to go through all these digital uh, production techniques. Uh, you have a course which be will, which will become a distributed school. And I think in, in a few years, it, it could grow to a university. Mm. And of course, but the big problem we challenge is um, accredita accredita accreditability. Accreditation. Yeah. Because that's that's based on uh, geography, actually. No, you cannot do that, mm -hmm. say, yeah, we are Fab Academy, we are global credi credibility. Um, but still, I mean, this is... Uh, because you, you have all these people learning all these skills, and then they could come back to the lab and do a research about certain things and give something back to you, or company can rent them in to do research for them. And we see a lot of that going on and actually we're working together uh, to drive this forward and I'm very excited about it because it's a kind of strange thing because Thomas and me we have gone through that on a very early stage where Neil was teaching it at the MIT itself and then you're sitting there in front of a screen and, and you're back to school you know mm. and but we had no gurus and so on it was very hard but now it's a kind of established you have all these local gurus you have mentors and it's very exciting. Uh, last year, we had about six students going for the diploma. And it's really tough to get it, because you have to go through all completely out of your comfort zone. You mm. have to program chips. You have to do more uh, uh, molding and casting, laser cutting. You have to do big things. Uh, and you always only have one week for an assignment. Mm. So it's a lot of sweat. So if you really got the diploma, you really have deserved it. That's for sure. I'm thinking this kind of all creative skills and being all around and actually taking apart the things around us and putting them back together, creating new things. It's a bit like Tiffany talked about this morning, that coding is just natural to youth. And to me, it's really positive that in this digital age, we're coming back to craft. We're coming back to creating stuff and being good at craft. And that's such a beautiful way because people always say, well, the digital takes us away from the original and takes away from reality. But I actually think it brings it back on a higher level. And yeah, exactly. It's more democratized. Exactly. But I also see that a lot of people think because we're talking about digital fabrication, everything has, been di has to be digital in a fab lab. It's not true. I was, just, I was just about to learn all Japanese wood joinery craft. And I love to combine all these things. And on the end, it's more about personalization. So we're going back being consumers. We're going back being our own producers because mm -hmm. we can make it ourselves. That's true. We got a question? Yes. Um, I, I saw your bass guitar you made. Yeah. Uh, it looked like you, you somehow scanned the fibers of the wood and then cut them deeper or somehow. How did you make that? 
Uh, no, actually, that, that, that was a uh, complete creation of the student. I gave him a raw three-dimensional body, and he wrapped, he actually hand-drawn all these lines like he liked it. And it. But it took him a long time. It was very difficult. But it has actually nothing to do with the structure of the wood itself. Okay, it looks really much like it follow the fibers. Ah, good. Is yeah. it good or bad? <laughs> Uh, normally, when you work with wood, you always want to follow the fibers because then the construction is much stronger. Yeah, yeah sure. It was also uh, properly quarter sawn uh, uh, mahogany body five years air dried, so that was okay. But instead of just milling it fine and sanding it down, uh, I was excited by these uh, structures, and I think it's very unique. I never saw any guitar with, an, with his own structure. We're going to take a short break, and I just want to say that Alex and Diana is on again later today with how you can use prototyping in educational frameworks. How can you see that on a bigger scale as places where we need learn new yeah, crafts? Actually, Diana, Diana will do it because I, I learned that I have to be in the jury. Yeah, I know. We made a mistake. We put it in the jury as well. Okay, we we'll that see. Out. We figure it yeah, out. Yeah, we figure it out. <laughs> we'll prototype it.